afternoon, all. Um, just like to welcome you all here. Hopefully, you've all enjoyed your um, your lunch lunch um, just now. Um, I'm Bevan Prophet. I'm the Farmer Council um, Chair for, for West, Western North Island Farming Up Wong Wanganui. Um, yeah, just like to introduce our um, our, our speaker Axel um, from Ag Research. He, he's a biologist who specialises in uh, oh, crikey. In, in my, uh, <laughs> immunology. He had worked on he had worked on human trans, transplantation and, and cancer vaccines in Germany, New Zealand, and the USA before he joined Ag Research at the Hopkirk Research Institute in 2010. Um, Axel's current research is focused on understanding the immune system of cattle, sheep, and deer with a particular interest in the interplay of nutrition, micro microbiome. Immunity and fertility. He develops and evaluates novel di diagnostics for infectious diseases and new vaccine strategies for livestock. Um, he also investigates if, if and how food strengthens people's immune system. So um, today he's presented on, on new science and technology to take tackle facial eczema. So um, yeah, welcome, Axel. Um, good afternoon. Um, Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Axel Heiser, I'm German by birth, Kiwi by heart. Um, came here 30 years ago for a vacation and loved it and came back for another vacation and then it took me a bit of time to get my points together to get a residency visa. Um, made a bit of a shift from clinical human cancer immunotherapy into animal science to come here. Um, I think that left fielder aspect of things is starting to fade. Um, can't claim it that much anymore. Um, I'm an immunologist, so I do everything um, related to your body's defense against pathogens. Um, what I will talk about has absolutely almost nothing to do with immunology. It is just um, a thing that I got very passionate about over the years. Um, seeing what facial eczema does and how little is done about it. Um, and about a year ago, I was at a meeting with the facial eczema working group and said, well, there's a whole lot of things that from a science perspective we can do to try and fix this. Um, and that caused some enthusiasm and Beef and Lamb came on board. And since then we have developed um, this research program that we are going to try to get some funding from, um, from Beef and Lamb, from MPI, and from others. Um, and that's what I, what I want to talk about. So I, I will talk about what, what we actually know about facial eczema, very shortly what it costs us, um, how is it currently managed, um, what the future risks are, um, and then go into the core of it, um, what don't we know, and how can we change that, and what else can we do about facial eczema. So what do we know? Um, facial eczema is caused by a toxin, sporidesmin, um, that's produced by fungus, that's called Pithomyces chatarum, or the newer name is Pseudopithomyces chatarum. Um, it grows in pasture at certain climatic conditions um, in late summer normally. Um, so we need the fungus in the pasture. We need it to produce spoidesmin. Not all of them do it. Uh, we need a climate trigger to become, for it to become a big enough population. Then it needs to make spores, and the spores need to contain spoidesmin, the toxin then these spores need to be ingested by animals, and then the toxin will damage the liver and the bile duct, and the body can't um, break down certain products that then cause this photosensitivity that you all know when we have these horrible effects on the animals. But actually, the health effects start way earlier, and we believe that there's a whole lot of subclinical undetected damage to liver that hits on production um, long before we see that facial asthma is coming. So what about the cost? Um, 
whenever I try to get money for this, MPI or MB asks me what is it costing the, the industry, and it's incredibly tricky to get good numbers on that. Um, there is an older paper that says, well, we're talking about 60 to 120 million dollars a year. Um, from the big outbreaks, we know that can easily be 200 and more million dollars. Um, Emma Cuttins has done some exciting work around, or, or excellent work around, um, what's called subclinical facial eczema or sporodesmin toxicity. And I think we are, we are vastly, vastly underestimating the damage that comes from animals just not performing as well um, because they are fighting this, this um, sporodesmin toxicity. And there's a risk. Um, of losing market access if, if, you know, imagine a picture like that being in The Guardian, saying this is how sheep look in New Zealand, um, that could cause some damage to, to market access. And we don't know how much that would cost. So how's it managed? Um, Beef and Lamb has um, put it all together. Um, breeding is a big part of it. There's um, quite a bit of effort into breeding um, fish lexma tolerant stock, um, both in beef and sheep. Um, then there is um, pasture management, um, alternative crops, fungicides, and eventually zinc treatment. Um, and that's about, if you do two out of these three, um, you have a good chance to, to be ahead of it if it's not a, not a terribly bad year. So what are the risks? What is the future holding for us? Um, number one is climate warming. The fungus likes the warm, wet, late summers. And if our warm, wet, late summers spread into regions where they are currently not um, to be found, then we increase the areas that have a facial eczema risk. And there's a study from 2009 that shows um, how this area is going to, to grow. Um, a lot more of the North Island will be um, affected, and even areas on the South Island that don't really care about facial eczema right now will have to get used to it. Another risk is what the EU and likely the US will do. Um, the EU is on the way to, to ban zinc um, for agricultural application completely. Um, that doesn't mean that, that we will ban it here in New Zealand, but it means if you want the market, market access to the EU, um, there might be the requirement to comply um, with that. And that is, in my opinion, a very major threat. And then the consumer concerns, as I said, um, just having the disease is one thing. And for everybody who knows how the breeding um, works for tolerant stock, um, that is not something that a concerned consumer um, would like to see or know. So this all led me and a, and a group of scientists from Ag Research and Landcare and um, Victoria University and Lincoln, I think, um, to start thinking, um, what do we know and how can we fill knowledge gaps to develop some, some new tools um, to fight um, facial eczema? And the, the, the top question is, why is it a problem here and almost nowhere else. We have warm, wet summers elsewhere in the world, but facial eczema hardly ever appears. There's, there's pockets in, in southwestern Germany, in France, maybe in Spain, but it's, it's very rare. So something here must be different. Um, and the first, the first thing that could be different is that our, our fungus is genetically different. It just makes more sporodesmin or at different times. So the, the science to do is to look at 
um, the genetics of the pathomyces here in New Zealand and globally and see if it's different. Um, and we are on our way to identify all the genes that, that make the sporidesmin in the fungus. And once we know that, we can better understand if the fungus here in New Zealand does it differently from elsewhere in the world. Um, we know that um, there are strains of pathomyces that do not produce sporidesmin. Even here, we sometimes have a high spore count, but no sporidesmin in the, in the spores. So we have quite a few knowledge gaps around that. Um, there's a whole raft of things that we don't know around the physiology and the ecology of this fungus. When does it grow? How does it grow? Who eats it? Um, who competes with it? Um, all these things could be different here. Maybe we fail to import a predator who eats that fungus that is present in Europe and the US. Um, so that's what I mean when I say ecology. And the physiology that goes back to the genetics. What's going on in the fungus? Why does it make the sporidesmin? Why does it make spores? When does it do all that? Um, if we better understand that, that, we can use that to develop new tools. Um, as I said, there are, there are um, efforts to breed for um, tolerant sheep and cattle. Um, and I think if we understood better which genes are, are involved and how they're regulated, and if we can test for them, then we can support the breeding efforts. And this is one of the, the new ideas that came up when we, when we discussed this. Maybe the, the, the microbes and the rumens of our animals are different from the rest of the world. Maybe the rumen um, bacteria in the rest of the world do something to the spores, eat the sporidesmin, take it out of the equation. Maybe that's a difference. So we can look at our, our rumen microbiomes here in New Zealand and um, find out if that's something that can help us. So there's a lot of science questions that, that we can tackle and a few projects that I, that I mentioned. So what, what can we actually do with that? Um, we would like to develop a risk model, um, a tool, an app in the end that you can use. You go out on your paddock, it pulls the weather data, it pulls your farm history, it pulls um, the time of the year, your stocking rate, whatever you have, and it gives you a number, a risk for FE to show up on your farm. And it doesn't do anything against FE, but it gives you peace of mind if you don't have to worry about it. Um, and that alone, to me, is, is worth a lot. Um, this is a project I'm, I'm very um, enthusiastic about. We know that our spore counting is not working really well. It counts the spores, yes, but it depends on the sampling, where and when and how on your paddock you sample, and it doesn't account for spores not having sporidesmin in them. So we would like to develop a better um, method that gives you a, a strategy to sample across your farm and then only counts the spores that are actually toxic. And also not helping to get rid of FE, but helping to manage your animals would be an early diagnosis. Not just seeing that the animal is sick, having a test that allows you to find this very early toxicity and on the liver and giving you a window to treat before damage that is sometimes irreversible um, is done. And I talked about the ecology and physiology of the fungus and what we can learn from that. Um, the more we learn from that, the better our pasture management can become. If we understand what the fungus likes and dislikes, then we can manage pastures accordingly and just make its life harder. Um, for the breeding, as I said, the Remgard testing is the standard currently. Um, we are currently working on a test um, that can be done on a blood sample. 
or ideally on a saliva sample from a sheep or cattle that tells us from that test, in vitro test, outside of the animal, how tolerant or susceptible this animal is. If we had that, we did, wouldn't have to do the dosing of, of, of the sires. We could just test all our stock and select based on this test. That would make for, for far more efficient breeding. Um, we are through the first phase of this, um, funded by beef and lamb. Um, we know that the sporidesmin toxicity causes um, all sorts of changes in our cell culture model. Um, the next stage now is to find um, animals that are known to be very susceptible and known to be very tolerant, and then do the same assay and see if we can produce um, differences. Excuse me, is that test carried out before animals have been exposed, or after they've been exposed? Because I think the question is, that should be independent of exposure or not. That should be, ideally, you can do that all year long. Yeah. Um, so we are looking for these herds, and then we, we, th we throw all of our science might at it. We look for proteins and, and DNA and RNA and, and metabolites, and we find a signature that differentiates the susceptible from the tolerant. Um, and if we manage to do that, um, then we can turn that into a, a simple test that can be done by a, by a diagnostic lab or maybe even on farm. Yes. Has any, been, any research been done on actually raising the zinc in the pasture? <laughs> no. In, my, in no. my area, we are definitely at least 50% down on what it should be for good animal health. We've got about 28 parts per million in most of the pastures that I test. What would happen if we raise that 28 and put it up to 60 parts per million? I, I, I come to that um, shortly. <laughs> um, so this is the part where I, I can shine as an immunologist, vaccines. Um, I think that um, sporogesmin is a really small molecule, and, and these small molecules are normally really, really hard to, to, to um, induce an immune response. But we have a few tricks um, where we couple the sporogesmin to a bigger protein, and we might be able, very carefully, we might be able to develop a vaccine that produces antibodies in the animal that will then neutralize the sporidesmin. So even if they eat it and it goes into the bloodstream, the antibodies will catch it before it does any damage. That's a very long shot um, project, I have to admit. Um, from the work that I talked about how to better understand the microbiome and the rumen. Um, if we do that, and if it proves to be an issue, then we might be able to come up with new treatments, um, probiotics, prebiotics, <laughs> other treatments on the rumen microbiome that then affect um, the uptake of sporidesmin. And here we'll come to, to plants and what they can do. We know that certain plants contain more zinc. We know that certain plants contain other compounds that might do the same, the same thing as, as zinc. Um, and we are currently partnering with a, an expert on Rongoa, which is the Maori um, knowledge of, of human health, and how we can apply their knowledge of indigenous plants um, to help us with facial eczema as a treatment, but also possibly as something we can either include in the pasture or include into other plantings on farm that we let the animals occasionally browse on. Um, so that's, we know that we can um, do something um, on the zinc content, um, content. And one colleague of mine is saying ryegrass is the culprit, um, which doesn't help you, I guess. Um, but <laughs> it just gets back to Right now, we, we put a capsule down, down their throat and it disperses X amount of yeah. parts per million of, of zinc on a daily basis. Um, some of the reports suggest that the, the zinc going down the throat is, is too high, it's actually a toxic, is a toxic one. Yeah. 
So if, if we actually go back to, as I say, go back to the pasture on putting zinc actually onto the plant, so, so it is absorbed yep. like, like a herbicide. So then the animal starts to eat it. The, the industry I'm in, we don't seem to get the amount of facial eczema yep. on, on, any, on any of the farms as, as a comparison to the ones alongside us. So, yeah, it's, it's just, so that there must be something that we, some research that says that if we lift the, from 28 parts per million of zinc in the pasture and lift it up to 60, there is research saying that that is ideal for animal health. Yeah, that, w that would be part of this big program that we're trying to find out um, if this is true and how we can avoid bringing zinc out. Maybe we can introduce plants that naturally have a high zinc well, there content. Is a Apart from plantain, plantain certainly has, has a higher level, dock certainly have a higher level. But yeah. a, apart from that, we're going to have to, have to apply product onto the general grazing, and I'm not talking about putting in a special crop, I'm not talking about anything else, it's just applying a mixture of items, including zinc, to actually lift yeah. or double the, the level in the pastures, because every pasture that we test is at least 50% um, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. just not there, so. I, uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how that works with the with a critical view of zinc in, in, in Europe, uh, if that would be allowed. If, well, this would be if allowed it's, 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 a, uh, it's an organic zinc, it's not, yeah. uh, we, we, don't, we don't use oxide, it's, it's a sulfate that we used to use. Now, now it's a, well, what do they call it, it doesn't matter, it's, it's, it's a different type of zinc, it goes into the plant a lot quicker, and it stays in the plant. Okay. So yeah. the, the research has been done, but, like you're going to do it all again. So. Now we will certainly come back to you and ask what, what has been done. Um, and, and, and another thing we would like to do is we, we would like to, to put our, our um, farm systems experts and social scientists on to what is the current practice, what are the true economic impacts of, of it, because if we want to prove the success of the whole project in the end, we need to show that it's saving or making money. Um, and what is the social impact? Um, and that's another thing that is that, that I think is, is important. Um, I can see the stress that the risk of facial eczema causes in farmers. I'm just being afraid of, of having it. Um, and if we can take that away, that alone to me um, is an important thing to do. So to summarize, how am I doing time? Oh. Um, there's a lot of science we can do um, and that we would love to do as scientists. But more importantly, there's quite a raft of things that can come out of this, um, as I said, risk prediction, better spore counting, um, testing for the breeding, early diagnosis, actually knowing how any of this impacts on farm, better pasture management, better zinc management probably, um, more efficient breeding, potentially a vaccine, and quite a few treatments that could go side by side with zinc or replace it. So this is something we are currently writing up um, and it will go to MPI for an SFFF fund which means we need some co-funding for it which Beef and Lamb will um, carry partly and then we'll go, we'll go around with our head to other industry organizations and try to get as much money as we can to do as many of these things um, as we can afford to do um, and then hopefully um, put an end to facial eczema. I think there's an actual chance that we can remove it as a problem from New Zealand. Thank you. I was far too fast? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I'm... Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, 
The heritability is, is quite high, um, resistance to pay for X, yeah, 3%. Um, and, and that's in sheep. I presume it's much the same in the cattle. Um, there's no there's no in the um, cattle. And, but on that basis, it would suggest that um, breeding is, is, is the way forward. I mean, sheep industry is showing that. Um, so what will it take to be able to get genetic markers or some markers it would take to find these markers, and my, my agri-research colleagues in Lincoln are working on that, and so far they're struggling to find markers. It does mean they are not there. It means probably that it's not, not one marker, but a whole profile of markers, and we need to do a bit more work on the genetics to understand it. Um, if we understand a bit more what's involved on the molecular side of things, that might help us to, to, to look a bit more targeted at certain genes and see if, if they, they play a role. So how much research is there? A little bit or lots? <laughs> That's a very relative question. Um, I would say a little bit. Yeah, so we could wait forever for some results. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's research is always limited by funding. And um, facial eczema is, is one of these diseases that if you ask around, everybody says, yeah, it's a big problem. If you say, well, then please pay us to do something about it, then the answer is normally, oh, it's not that big of a problem. Not this year and not on my farm. Uh, how far away is the um, so the, the, the plan <laughs> is to have to spend the next nine months um, doing the test in the lab with these divergent groups of animals that we first have to find and define. Um, then spend another three to six months to turn it into a, a lab test. So we, that's about a year. And then to really market that test or put it out there and believe that it does something, we probably need to, to test a few thousand animals, which will take time. The money is there. Beef and lamb has, has put it on the table. Um, but we need the time to do it. So I, I would say 18 to 24 months, um, probably closer to two years. But then, then we can hopefully say goodbye to the dosing of animals. Sorry, just, just, just back up a step on, on that. Is that a test um, to see the FB tolerance um, without needing to expose yes. it to, to yeah. And how okay. how's that um, test done? Is that like saliva or Yeah, we, 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 we have we have done it with, with blood so far. Um, and the, the idea is that the blood cells react at, Similarly to, to the liver cell, not not the same, but similarly. And we, we 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 see profiles. We see certain proteins and RNA and metabolites come up in cells that we have exposed to to sporidesmin. So that works. Um, we now need to see if there is a difference between the the tolerant and the not so tolerant animals. But a lot of the molecules we have identified are involved in anti toxicity pathways, so I'm reasonably confident that we find something. Um, but the trick will be for this to become a, a test that's a dollar or two dollars um, a sample and not 150 or 250 or 500. And then you can take blood samples from, from your animals and have them all tested. Or ideally, that's where I want to, want to go, is a, is, a, is a saliva swap, similar to the Kala swap you do. Yeah. Can you there's going to be one question. Can you see that that would be a viable test on a commercial level for like testing the food for the yeah. uh, How long after it came out did you see that that would be affordable for a commercial farm rather than just a long No, we, we, when I say we turn it from a lab assay to, to a, a, a labor, laboratory research assay into a diagnostic lab assay, we will do that with somebody who knows the stuff. Um, either Gribbles or IDEX or somebody else, and we will make sure that it doesn't become a moneymaker for somebody. It, it's for us, it needs to be out there to be used. It needs to be an industry good test.
test. And that's why I think it, it will be something simple in ELISA or PCR or something that these labs do all the time that's, that's affordable. Um, yeah. Um, well, actually, I haven't thought about that. I, I would. I would assume that there is a good chance that a test that that shows the difference between susceptible and tolerant for sporidesmin covers under other fungal toxins as well. But I don't want to Spirit. promise that. Because the guys are selecting four fungal toxins, especially this one, they're actually finding that they get staggers. I can speak to the South, we have the same, we have issues with grass staggers and pockets and that, we have real problems. We have the same thing with the tolerance, which is very much more, but we've been doing it for years. And we had instant, it was pretty easy to try to take a new system. So it was a late, as soon as we stopped the patient, we stopped the screening. Yeah, that's a good, I'll, might include that into our screening program. It's a good idea. Yeah. You didn't double the budget we asked you for. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, where do we go with the zinc thing? Because um, you're saying, you know, like 2022 in Europe, um, you know, sheep, sheep's got the, um, the breeding tolerance thing, and I, like the farmer over here, have been. Um, getting rams from up north for um, 20 odd years uh, with high eczema tolerance. Um, but I, I graze a lot of young cattle and I use about a ton of zinc a year through a dosatron. Um, what, what, what are my future options going to be with that? And I'm sure there's a lot of other, other farmers too that are growing young bulls or grazing dairy heifers or whatever that use a lot of zinc in their, in their system and, and the, whole, you know, the, the whole dairy industry that has as well. Um, they haven't moved down that st stage of doing any, any breeding or marking, but you know, so like that's if they started now, like we're still talking 15 years away before before there would be any um, you know, junior gain from from that sort of thing. So, like, you know, we, we, what's the next thing that that we can use in that sort of area if if we can't use zinc through our dosatrons or um, zinc boluses? Yeah. Uh -huh. I agree. I see this as, a, as quite a major threat. I, one, one way is, is certainly to look at the, the, the way you apply the zinc. And if we find more efficient ways so that we can, can lower the dose, we might just sail under what's allowed in, in the EU and be fine with it. But we need alternatives, um, either another product or another drug or some kind of treatment to replace it. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't think that, that in New Zealand we will we'll see a zinc ban anytime this soon, but the market pressure from, from Europe and probably the US will, will, will be there. What's the, what's the science behind their move to hand zinc oxide? Yeah. <laughs> or is there any? <sighs> There's a lot of mythology around that. There. There's a lot of, it's, it's one of these things where, where the, the discussions are not very reasonable in the, in the best sense. It, it comes from zinc in sunscreens. It comes from zinc in, um, that's um, used to raise piglets. Um, and people are just concerned about it. It's, yeah. You were in vitro tolerance test. Um, is that uh, is it going to be just for sheep, or are you going to do it across the whole spectrum that it's going to be applied? Sheep and cattle, and hopefully deer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm well aware that FE is a deer problem as well. Yeah. It's the reason that um, they're not making progress on the cattle is that there are not enough animals being subjected to the tests, or the people are prepared to. <coughs> Do that to Potentially, it's hard to tell. I, I, the, the, the sheep breeders are just, there's a lot more push for, for FE tolerance than, than amongst the cattle breeders for reasons that I, I don't understand. Um. Sure.
were saying the, um, the vaccine's tricky because it's so small. Is there an example of any other vaccines where they've linked it to a bigger protein? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't talk about it. I mean, this is my, my hobby horse project in there. Um, so the, the, it has been tried 20 years ago here in New Zealand. Uh, there was a vaccine. And the facial, actual facial eczema in the vaccinated animals got worse. Um, so when I, when I presented this as an idea, all the older colleagues, older than me, um, at Ag Research said, no, don't try, that can't be done, it has been tried, we can't do it. Um, I think I know why, they, why, why the, these attempts didn't, didn't work. They actually used a bovine, a cattle protein to link um, the sporidesmin too. So I think they might have caused a bit of autoimmunity in these animals. Um, and the reason why I'm optimistic about it is there's a whole raft of work on um, vaccines against um, recreational drugs. You can, there, there are clinical trials now going on in the world on vaccines against nicotine, caffeine, heroin, cocaine, and these are all small molecules that look very similar. I mean, they're chemically different, but they, they are small and they are, have similar binding um, capabilities to sporidesmin. And they all use different proteins and they know how to vaccinate against them. So we can borrow from all this work. Um, and I'm currently waiting for a company in the US to build me a conjugate of sporidesmin with one of these proteins and then we will Try it. Okay. Hey, um, well, well, Axel, um, thank you very much. That was awesome. There's, there's no um, crystal ball, unfortunately. No. But um, <laughs> we've just got to keep work, working away at it. Um, just on, on behalf of um, everyone here, we've just got a small gift. For you, so. Thank you very so, much. So, um, yeah, th th thank, th you th th thank you very much.